Thank you everyone for coming and good evening. My name is Alice. I'm a third year MRC student originally from Brazil. Uh, I'm currently in Sao Paulo and I'm the co -director, one of the co-directors of Latin GSAP. Latin GSAP is an interdisciplinary student organization dedicated to the promotion, discussion, and reflection of contemporary issues and ideas in Latin America. The overarching theme of this semester uh, in Latin GSAP is authority. Authority refers to the acknowledgement of the existence of oneself through the capacity to recognize the other as such, a singular, a subject, subjective person. Authority is an essential process to achieve empathy, the capacity to put ourselves in someone else's shoes. If we cannot see the other, we cannot respect them, or if we can only see the other as a negation of oneself, we cannot relate. So tonight, collaboration with Professor Nadit as co-creator and with support from ELAS, Col uh, Columbia Global Center Rio and Columbia Global Center Santiago, Latin GSEPs wants to kick off the fall semester with a conversation among GSEPs alumni from different programs. Before, during, and after GSEP aims to gather alumni with a shared identity of being from Latin America in the United States, but bringing different backgrounds, perspectives, experience in their field. We believe that the panel's experience and knowledge before, during, and after GSEP will bring tremendous value to the GSEP community, and especially to the incoming students. So I would like to introduce tonight's moderator, Ines Yupanqui from Bogota, Colombia. She graduated from the MSAD program in 2017 and received her bachelor's in architecture at Pontificia Universidad uh, Javeriana in Bogota. She currently works as an architectural designer at Leslie Gill Architect in New York for three years. Okay. So thank you all for joining us this evening and let's start by introducing our wonderful four panelists. So first we have uh, Luisa Canuto from Campinas, Brazil. She graduated from the EMARC program in 2019 and holds a Bachelor in Architecture from Pontificia Universidad Católica de Campinas. She's currently living in New York and working as a junior architect at Cook uh, Fox Architects. Then we have uh, Cecilia Gonzalez Rubio join, uh, joining us from Mexico. Cecilia graduated from the AAD program, um, the, the Master in Advanced Architectural Design in 2019, and she holds a Bachelor in Architecture from the Universidad Iberoamericana Ibero in Mexico City. She is currently living in New York and working as a collaborator architect at Territorial Empathy. Our third guest is Jose Gerardo Ponteneto from Fortaleza, Brazil. Jose graduated from the Master in Urban Design program in 2018, and he holds a Bachelor in Architecture from the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago. And he is currently living in New York and is an urban designer at HOK. Uh, last but not least, we have Pauline Claremont from Santiago de Chile. Pauline graduated from the Master in Urban Planning in 2019, and she holds a Bachelor in Architecture from the Universidad de Chile. She's living in New York, and she's an urban planner at ACOM. Pauline was also one of the founders and active supporters of Latin GSAP. Um, so now the panelists will share with us what was their experience before, during, and after GSAP what was their perception about GSAP and what made them choose this school over other institutions. Some might share with us what is their opinion regarding some of the questions posed by the Black Student Alliance and what was their reaction to the Eurocentric education at GSAP. And finally, we will also learn from their current experience and how the Latin American background fed into their careers. Uh, I would like now to I would like to give the floor now to Luisa. Thank you so much, Ines. Um, thank you so much, um, everyone, for inviting us. Um, very excited to um, have discussion this discussion with you today. I'm going to share my screen. Can everyone see me? I see the screen. Yep. Yes. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> okay. So, um, okay. 
So as Ines said, um, my timeline um, in relationship to GSEP, before I came here, I finished my bachelor's in architecture and urban planning in Campinas, um, went to GSEP between uh, 2016 and 2018, and I've been at Cook Fox ever since. So before I came to GSEP, um, you know, um, you know, what brought me to GSEP, besides, you know, its worldwide known excellence, um, you know, it was the sort of different uh, curriculum, you know, that was more formal and conceptual uh, based, uh, which was different, you know, from my Brazilian, you know, um, program focused um, pedagogy. So that was, uh, besides the fact that it's also New York, but, you know, that was a guiding factor for my decision to come to DSEP. Um, this project was an institutional project um, that I did in my last semester. It was about creating a center for restoration and conservation of a rainforest park that was in a highly um, unequal and segregated mm -hmm. area. During GSEP, um, you know, I personally always appreciated the, the diversity of international students. Um, I felt that um, there were a few Latin oriented classes available that everyone would benefit from taking. One of my favorite theory classes was Plastic Modernity, um, Art, Sculpture and Cinema in Latin American Architecture by Luis Car Caranza. Um, you know, he was great, very thorough and very passionate. I highly recommend that class. Um, uh, this project in the screen was done on Studio 5 with Richard Plants. It was a studio that focused on responding to the damage caused by the hurricanes in 2012 in Vieja, Puerto Rico. And my exploration was about the dissemination of construction knowledge with recyclable materials through the development of an encyclopedia mm -hmm. that uh, potentially could be shared and used by the Vieques residents. So, you know, throughout um, my time as a student, I always tried to uh, think about myself and how I can make a difference, you know, how I can uh, take action um, in you know, aspects of, of inequality and diversity you know, that are very current and very important mm -hmm. right now to be uh, discussed. Um, so after GSEP, I've been uh, working at Cook Fox Architects. I met them through the career fair. You know, it was a great match for me. I, I believe in their mission of healthy, sustainable architecture that goes beyond um, the environment um, and uh, encompasses uh, social and economic um, subjects. So these are, I'm going to go through some of the projects that I've been involved with um, this past year. This is um, a two tower residential complex in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, you know, one of the, before every project at Cook Fox, we always look at the Manhattan um, research, you know, to so we can learn about the uh, original landscape um, so we can, you know, respect it and potentially incorporate it into the projects. And this project, we looked at, the site is close to the Potomac River, so we looked a lot at the sedimentation. Um, and Crystal City has a strong um, history of uh, masonry uh, manufacturing. That's also something that we've looked at and tried to incorporate into the project. Um, this uh, project, Terminal Warehouse, um, you know, the, the building was originally constructed in 1891. It was a former freight distribution hub. Um, you know, the facility, you know, remains a potent symbol of New York City's industrial past. It's one of the few remaining true arc and timber structures uh, in the city. So that's, that was very exciting, you know, and 
So Cook Fox mission was to restore and reuse the building, building as a mixed use office offices uh, complex. Um, you know, we, you know, always trying to preserve and, and enhance um, the strong historic elements of the building. This is an interior view of the project. You know, uh, one, one beautiful aspect of this building is that there's the, a tunnel, uh, the train track, that the train tracks uh, cross through the whole building, um, you know, because it used to be a warehouse, uh, a storage uh, warehouse. Uh, and, you know, with the project, we're hoping to, and it was hidden for many decades under the floor, but we're trying to, um, bring the tracks up and, you know, incorporate some kinetic furniture on it, you know, as trying to remember and, and, and value its historic um, uh, uh, importance. So this project, um, it's a project I'm currently working on. Uh, it's a private residence um, in Sag Harbor. You know, uh, we were inspired by the local fauna and the, um, you know, the oysters and the, and the, the water ripples, you know, the, the elements of nature to that, you know, helped us inform the, the formal exploration of the building. You know, uh, so I, I feel, I feel that as a as a, a young architect, I, I I keep trying to think of ways that I could make a difference and, and improve. Um, you know, and through recent discussions with other colleagues from the office, you know, we've we've come up with a sort of a we're calling it a justice league, uh, where we where we discuss where we think we could make the most difference in one of the Oh, sorry. So this is another um, another view at the entrance of the, the the project. But I just want to say that um, you know education is the basis of all change. Um, so I think it's really important to um, continue this conversation in, in these types of events. Um, and that's it. That's all I have to show today. Thank you, Luisa. Yes. So we're now moving to Jose. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, so, wait. You see the screen? Yep. So uh, just to give a little introduction, as it was mentioned before, um, I'm from Brazil. I graduated from the AUD program in 2018, and I've been working as an urban designer in HOK for two years, almost two years now, here in New York. I um, wanted to thank, first, uh, Latin GSAP for inviting me and giving the opportunity to talk about Latin America. And just wanted to touch upon the the theme of this fall, which is austerity. Austerity, I think, is a very fortunate um, moment to kind of choose this theme, especially because I guess all the polarization that has been going on in in Latin America, and especially in Brazil, which I think kind of hurts um, the debate uh, of how we can improve. So uh, I'm going to start with why I came to GSEP and why I chose GSEP uh, to do my master's in urban design. And I think that has a direct relation to where I come from and the challenges that my, home, my hometown and my home state face. Uh, I guess also my biggest inspiration for after graduating in architecture to focus on, on urban design was these same challenges. Uh, 
I was mentioned like I graduated in Chicago and then I went back to Brazil to work for a year. And I guess after you go back and you have this background in architecture and urban urbanism, you kind of start looking into the urban urban relationships of your city in a different way. Uh, I guess a more uh, wise way of like looking into things and understanding better. Um, so that's what happened to me when I went back. And as you can see, this this region, Northeast region in Brazil is, uh, most of it is in the sem semi-arid climate and you can see points of desertification. Um, so this, que this question of uh, wetness and, and uh, water scarcity in this region is kind of, it's very important. Uh, it has brought like a lot of poorness to to the area historically, and also prompts prompt uh, lots of migration from the north to the south of Brazil. So after I I I went back, that kind of like caught my attention, and uh, I guess was one of the main reasons that I wanted to focus on urban design. So the economy of this area is is mostly like small farmers. Uh, you have livestock and you have family agriculture and with all those droughts that happen every season they have to start um, looking into another ways of like surviving dur during these times uh, it's it is also like this type of living is very important for our culture and the culture of the northeast uh, a lot of art has been done uh, to talk about these these modes of living, uh, like lo lots of books uh, that kind of discourse about what we call the deep Brazil, like this countryside, and this, you know, uh, the, these challenges and this these modes of living, um, and the migration as well. So when I wanted to come. And, and do my master's in urban design. I wanted, I, I looked for a school that kind of had uh, a little bit of this relationship to, to water. And as you can see, the urban design program uh, led by Kate Worf in, in GSEP uh, has historically like been a place where they study water urbanism. These are all the uh, studios from the last years and I had the opportunity to go to Aqaba in Jordan which has similar um, conditions to the region I come from uh, so it's very interesting to see like the different modes of agriculture that they use there and different ways of living with similar conditions and it's still different from uh, from my region from where I came from so these are just some diagrams we used to make uh, just to understand the relationships of goods, relationships of, um, of stakeholders, the relationship between water and land, the productive landscapes. So it was always interesting to compare that to, you know, the experience that I had back home. And I also had the opportunity to focus on other projects that I was interested on. Uh, especially uh, directly related to Latin American, which was the question of urban violence. And like uh, do studies about planning policies in formal settlements, in this case, uh, Medellin, uh, for a conflict urbanism class. So these things, I mean, it was kind of very important that I came to GSEP knowing what my interests were and are. Um, so I could kind of guide myself throughout this the period that I studied there with you know the classes that touch upon this Latin American um, issues. So just talking about during GSEP the, the perception, per, per, perception of Latin America practices um, and just thinking about the the letters that the letters from the Black Student Association and the Black faculty at GSEP. And how it made me think a little bit, I 
last few weeks, uh, I have been reading more about historically, like the question of race in Brazil and and how it's a very complex issue historically as well. So it's it's just uh, interesting to see like how at the same time that there's a lot of similarities in Latin America about inequality, urbanization rate, violence, deforestation, all things that I think all of the countries share. Uh, there's a lot of uh, specific things to each country as well. Um, we have different history, different colonization process, different urban structures. So I guess it's, it's, uh, it's hard to talk about like a Latin American urbanism. I think it could be a generalization a little bit. Um, so I think not being aware of that kind of takes away a little bit from the debate of, of the urbanism in Latin America. So I guess there are two things that are completely, we shared the same same issues, but there's this um, spe specific things for, for each of, of the countries. Uh, but I also think like there are a lot that a lot of things that we can learn from the urban interventions, the urban actions in Latin America, in GSAP as well. That maybe we could, uh, I don't know, maybe classes or you know, um, the time we we study there, we could learn more. Um, just like to touch upon this uh, issue of like urban violence, like two different very different approaches from Medellin on the left and then Rio on the right. On the left, like it's heavily based on um, culture and connectivity. And in the right, it's a heavily based, I, I, I don't think we can even say that it's an urban design project. It's more like an urban action of uh, UPPs. It's heavily based on police. And this project on the right has been discontinued. So, I mean, I think there is a lot of things in Latin America that we can learn from, and what works and what doesn't work. So after GSEP, I uh, just wanted to leave this quote, this quote here: um, "All art is local before being regional, but if it works, it will be contemporary and universal." Uh, I think this is the thing that I kind of bring. Uh, that being from, from Latin American background kind of uh, teaches me in, in my prof professional careers that the value of local knowledge, and that has a lot to do with urban design as well. Just um, how we still have in Latin America this uh, relationship to the local knowledge, even in the big, in the big cities. Um, and it, it kind of, uh, I think, just teaches me of like the importance of the interaction interaction with the stakeholders. Um, uh, for example, in this picture, you can see how complex our urban systems are, and it, it, sometimes it doesn't really matter how how much we study or how much experts we are in, in certain fields. So, like, I guess the local knowledge and the local people they are always they are always um, will know more about these types of systems than than we know. So it was something that was touched on in our urban design program in Colombia, but it's it's something that just being from Latin America, you you kind of um, you you have this direct relation to you know to the places that where you come from and and the reality the the reality of like this, those, all those complex urban systems. Um, so that's it. That's what I have. Thank you, Jose. We are moving to, uh, with Cecilia. Sorry, Cecilia, or I'm sorry, I got confused. Yeah, Cecilia. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you for having me as well. Um, let me just share my screen. I think, Jose, if you stop sharing, then we can get Cecilia's screen up. 
Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so where is it? Can everyone see it? Can everyone hear me? Yeah? Yes. Okay. Um, so right after I finished, I guess my, my conversation is going to be a little bit of more on the informal side. Um, Right after I finished my undergraduate studies, I worked for a year with an office called Taller Territorial in Mexico City as an architectural researcher. And we were studying the movement of migrant bodies throughout Mexican territory. My role as an architect I think you're muted, Cecilia. Cecilia, you're muted. No, I had already started. <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 not the whole time. Just like the last two seconds. Okay, 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 okay. okay. Thank you. You're good. No worries. And so I'm going to go back a little bit. So my role as an architect here was to research uh, migrant routes, police stations, immigrant shelters, human trade hotspots, drug cartel territorial claims um, in order to overlap all of this and proof that violence happens. There's a systemic organization going on there uh, that's very intertwined both with government and organized crime. Um, and it's very dependent on this anonymous bodies that cross Mexican territory uh, in pursuit of their American dream. Um, I'm saying all of this because right here was when I realized that the architect's toolkit can be used for much more than just building um, and I fell in love with it and therefore I decided to pursue a master's degree. Um, so why GSAP? Um, what brought me to GSAP was um, that I really wanted to kind of push the boundaries of what I could explore with my architect toolkit. Um, I was very stubborn upon my decision. I only applied to GSAP because I really felt that as a school it promotes and welcomes a lot to explore the arena and elongate it and just be very playful with it, but also very productive. Um, I can say that uh, I made a great choice by choosing GSAP. Uh, while I was an AAD student, I was able to approach architecture through its most speculative lens. Um, and it was great because my background studying architecture in Mexico City was extremely technical. Um, and so I felt that I was able to complement my architectural background in a more holistic way, kind of going through the both to the two extremes and just making a hot pot of both. Um, when I got to GSAP, I was really overwhelmed, to be very honest. Everything was super different to what I was used to. Uh, the amount of work was beyond my conception, and I always felt that I was never going to be able to catch up. I feel what I really took out of my experience there was that I was able to push like boundaries and realize that I, I'm able to do a lot more than I ever thought. So it was incredible. And then. Um, after, I guess that my, uh, right now I'm collaborating with Territorial Empathy. So very similar to my work prior making the decision, let's see this, well, um, very similarly to my work prior deciding to pursue a master's degree. Right now I'm working with the Architects Toolkit to tackle uh, social injustice. Right now this is like a small video uh, that studies where the people left when the pandemic started, depending on their wage and um, basically their social economical um, level in the society plus their race. And we're doing like a bunch of super interesting uh, studies up on it and um, interventions on schools that are very marginalized and whatnot. Um, I guess just like to wrap up, I feel that my Latin background again um, has really helped me to um, be really interested in projects that tackle uh, marginalized communities because I feel that I was really 
close to them as a Mexican and just growing with them. Uh, but now being here in the United States, it has really helped me to just um, feed my toolkit with a bunch of more um, tools. And therefore I'm looking really forward to when the moment comes for me to go back to Mexico to just like keep on doing my own hot pot and um, bringing stuff that I learned from the US to Mexico and keep on pursuing my own stuff. And that's it. Thank you, Cecilia. So uh, last but not least, we have Pauline. Hi, let me see if I can share my screen. <clears throat> So, give me a sec. Portion of my screen. Something happened here. <laughs> Did it just happen? No, <laughs> give me a sec. I don't think it's showing. And let us know if you need us to share screen, Bodhi. Somehow it was working and now it's not, so I don't know. Let me try again. So I'm trying, let me close this and open it again. If not, go ahead and I think you guys have my file. So it's one more time. Okay, here we go. It's something with my PDF, I guess. Sometime now again, portion of screen. Okay. There we go. Now we should be good. Can you just share for me? I don't know why it's not working. Oh, now this, I think it's working, right? Perfect. Can you see it? All good. Uh, yes, it's working. Perfect. I'm sorry about that. No worry. So let me just make this smaller. So we can do. Okay. So let's see. Perfect. Yeah. So definitely thank you for the invite. <laughs> can you see my notes as well or just my screen? Just my presentation. Just your screen. All good. Yes, good. Perfect. Thanks. So, yeah, first, thank you for the invite. Uh, it's, it was interesting to see how you guys kind of made us uh, connect the dots through our past to our future. It was a good exercise, actually. <laughs> so I'll be talking a little bit about my experience in Chile and here in New York and just like sharing some reflections that I, I have related to that. So, um, so I started my career really working, wait, yeah, working as an architect. Uh, I decided to work independently. So I co-founded a small studio that we called Clam Architecture with my partner. Um, we started designing and building private and um, public projects focusing on small business and community facilities. These projects really gave us exposure to challenges uh, like managing minimal budgets, like minimal, like really minimal. <laughs> and then also uh, time constraints related to bureaucracy as well, and questions on how to create appropriate methodologies to be able to engage communities in the participatory processes. So when you start your office, you kind of start with what you have and then kind of trying to create those methodologies. I'll, we, I'll briefly show you two projects that kind of like shifted my mind from my background to architecture to planning. And those two were the ones that kind of brought me to studying urban planning, but also at GSAP. So first this experience um, working in a great community spaces for Osevio Lillo social housing project in Santiago, where um, this is a complex of team blocks that provide housing for 250 families approximately. So it's around 800 people. Um, this project was under the umbrella of the national program called Quiero Mi Barrio that um, probably many people know. And it had two phases. Uh, first, the challenge to design a perimeter fencing uh, solution to formalize the boundaries of the housing, housing complex. And second, design the common outdoor space for each block. 
in this project, the community engagement um, participatory process was needed to be able to withdraw and consent occupations and the, at the floor plan level, as you can see, color in red in the plan, um, and recover really that space for the community, like recover, recover that space back. So imagine <laughs> the challenge. So a key element for this local participatory project was really the continuous communication and engagement strategy with the community and the Programa Quiero Mi Barrio um, had a very interesting approach to that. They have two professionals in place. So they have someone from social sciences, like a psychology, psych, uh, from psychology or something in that realm and a community architect that they call. And we were the two professionals in place, uh, not in place, but like helping with the technical and the design and also creating the processes for participatory design. So at the end, a group of four people. And this was a very intense process. We met with the community for four months, almost every week and different timings so people can attend, people that are working. So it was a very intense and interesting process. And finally, uh, we were able to sign and approve all these documents um, by all the stakeholders, like meaning the community, but also municipality and regional uh, planning commissions as well. So from this project, we'd like to really underscore uh, the importance of the process, the energy and the hope that um, all neighbors brought to the table. <clears throat> With energy, I mean good and bad, you know, it was, we had fights, it was like, it was an intense process, right? Uh, but at the same time, really acknowledging the importance of design to build a shared identity in a community, because at the end, design really has an impact on daily life experiences, and small things are really big things at the end. Like, in this case, um, because of the perimeter, um, fencing people were and the design that we created with them they were able to have a number in their block you know so just like recognize where is your house so to be able to take a taxi or take a cab or receive your mail at home which is something that seems very like uh, small but at the end it changes their da daily life same with um as you can see this uh, the little kid like riding a bike so we created an area so they can put their trash that was kind of hidden so kids didn't have to engage with trash it like every time they go outside so very small details but at the end really made the difference <clears throat> so this project kind of uh, changed my perspective on how we architects are really in service of the communities and sometimes it was frustrating because we had some other ideas and they were a little more not as conservative for instance and yeah we had to kind of like move on from those to really engage with what the community needed at that moment and what they were able to to trade you know there's an existing fabric of relationship that was already set in place and in four months you can do so much um a second project that really changed my uh, my perspective was the green terrace community project i work as part of the interdisciplinary team for a nonprofit in santiago and I partnered with municipalities developing a local climate adaptation program. This program includes workshops at schools, community meetings to raise awareness and physical interventions as well that were collectively built and at the end publications um, to be able to push these interventions to actual climate policies, climate related policies. So this work kind of showed me the effectiveness of working interdisciplinarily and the importance of communication in a long-term strategy and how sometimes physical interventions can also be a tiny part of the process. So among those two experiences, I decided I needed a deeper understanding in urban planning processes, including funding strategies, policies, community outreach, management and equity issues, because at the end, these two projects, um, they are valuable, of course, but they are still under the umbrella of Santiago being a very segregated city and that the city where not everyone has the same quality of urban spaces. So um, let's move on to what happened during GSAP. So I, I finally chose GSAP uh, because of many academic reasons as other mentioned, but also because at that time I was obsessed with New York <laughs> climate strategy that they were putting up for the waterfront. So I kind of really wanted to live in this city to experience that as a student, as a citizen and engage with, with the city that was doing that. So um, 
During the program, I had the opportunity to explore um, resiliency and international development that were two passions that I had from before, but also I discovered my interest in urban analytics. I think that was a great, um, something that wouldn't have happened without GSAP. Um, here, the first images are showing um, studio that we had in Gowanus, where we created a toolkit for resiliency and we proved different uh, scenarios that we work with the communities and we test them with like art uh, makers that were living there. We also created a beta app so we kind of tried different tools and we put them together for NISEM, the emergency management office, so they can use it, use it as a prototype to continue this work but also for other uh, neighborhoods. So that was kind of like a very ground, grounded work and at New York so it was huge. Uh, <laughs> That's a huge experience. And the other one um, is an urban analytics project that we reverse engineering FEMA's model to define vulnerability for flo floating hazards that's called has HASES. And we added new proxies related to social indicators and proximity indicators. So that was experience. So we showed this project in Paris and San Francisco as well. And then this really made me understand that New York and the data availability that has the city, it's mind blowing and allows us to perform very granular and detailed analysis. And this is something that many cities are missing, you know, especially in Latin America. So I'm really looking forward to at some point kind of contributing with this knowledge to be able to develop um, data accessibility for planners and for communities to advocate as well. Um, so going a little farther from the academics, I wanted to show some Latin GSAP pictures actually, because my experience at GSAP uh, wouldn't have been the same without Latin GSAP. Uh, I was part of like the team that kind of started to like talk about what, that we needed a group and all that. And I see a lot of people in this call that are also in the images. And it's just, um, and so these are the first meetings that we have. Here are some others. And it was just great to see how um, a lot of people were filling that gap of like representation and probably in some programs, People had more professors that were from Latin America, and in our case, we didn't. So I think the conversation was missing, and it was great that from the student body, we were able to kind of put that together and have everyone come in from all the programs with tons of energy. So, and I'm also like just taking this slide to to thank uh, all the ones that are continuing doing it, and also when we started, we had alumni also being very helpful, and I remember Agustin helping us put together stuff with the GSAP incubator. So. I think just kind of like building a net, a network, but also a net, like a safety net for people that come with a different, with a similar background was something very special that we were able to do during the program. So I have two more slides, I'll move very quickly. Um, yeah, let's see. So after uh, I joined ACOM and I was able to mostly be involved in like, we have multiple projects, but especially transportation and run planning. So performing data analysis and ma uh, mapping data uh, for DOT and MTA projects. So we develop sidewalk accessibility analysis and some others for future policy. It's interesting work there and very detailed. So we work mostly with engineers and planners. Then um, community outreach planner, that's kind of like a second role that I have there. My experience in Chile has been key to really make me feel comfortable being uh, involved and designing outreach strategies for ACOM projects. Um, in working, I'm, now I'm really working in a much larger scale, not necessarily at the neighborhood level, but a, <clears throat> a design build project for the city that seeks to get input and facilitate dialogue among stakeholders by in all four boroughs. So it's huge. We're, creating a lot of workshops and attending multiple meetings with community boards, neighborhood adv adv advisor committees. So There's a ton of like agencies to really engage. And in contrast to Santiago, I felt that community groups are far more um, organized and, in the, and, and aware of the process of participation. And this is something that of course now is changing in Chile, I imagine many other countries as well. So after October, um, it's completely clear that Chile needs more ways to like engage and, and promote participation at all levels. So that's something that I'm, I'm, I'm sure we can continue to discuss and translate. And then <clears throat> uh, even if the scale of the outreach is completely different, I think there are some questions that can be applied that you can apply to any kind of outreach and participation process. 
and the questions are just simple. I'm just gonna leave them there. Maybe we can discuss later who is at the table. What are the implications of the participations in the outcomes? Is the communication strategy appropriate? And what are the ways to report back and maintain accountability? And these questions are really the challenges of like achieving equity in a participatory process. If these questions are not answered, then we might even not do it, right? Um, the last two images are part of the work that I did during COVID. So a lot of projects of the city for, were freezed. So I got the opportunity to work um, <clears throat> inside assessment for alternative facilities. So that was also kind of a special analysis um, related to resiliency work. And so, yeah, it's been a little bit jumping to different topics, but somewhat all the tools that I got in GSAP have been very useful. And the ones that I previously have in my experience in Chile have been also um, part of the success in a way. And then I'm moving to my last slide. And I wanted to mention this because I'm doing um, uh, currently some independent research with friends from Colombia, but especially with friends from Latin GSAP. So it was Laura, Tyreen around here. And it's been interesting just to have a space to um, support each other and cope with the pandemic and crisis and all that, but at the same time kind of uh, discuss and reflect about the unveiling inequalities in this process. So we started doing, in the first image, you'll see a study um, related about related about the historical public crises and the relationship with urban planning, mobility, and public space. So we did kind of like a historical review. We presented that in Chile in June, and then we created some visual op-eds and vis visualizations, and we sent it to Oculus Magazine AA. And I don't know, it feels like now we might be in a situation that we are obligated to communicate virtually, but at the same time, it feels like we might be even more connected than ever. So I'm just gonna leave it here and kind of open that as a, as a possibility to collaborate between regions. So now we might be living in the US, but the actual channels for communication are probably more open than ever. So I see that as an opportunity. So that's it. Okay, thank you all for sharing with us the path that you have followed to today and for also for um, taking us on a trip around Latin America through your projects. Uh, we have prepared some questions for you, but any of you feel free to jump in and, and tell us your perspective. So I'm going to start the conversation by asking Luisa and Cecilia, since you both completed your Bachelor in Architecture in Latin America and both mentioned very specific aspects of uh, GSAP when applying to, 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 the, to the program. Uh, what were your expectations about GSAP? Like I remember that back in the 90s, GSAP was known for its software or technological focus. Uh, so I'm wondering, was GSAP known for something specifically uh, when you both were applying to the school? Jump in. Um, I guess in my case, I I really wanted to counterpart my very technical approach with a school that would allow me to embrace uh, whichever topic, regardless of how whimsical it could it could it could sound. And I feel that GSAP really promotes that, and I'm very happy to say that I did find that. And I feel it really helped to to strengthen my 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 background as an architect for sure. I I agree with Cecilia. I definitely feel like it was a contribution. Uh, to be honest, I don't think I completely knew what I was getting into <laughs> at, at GSEP, but I was definitely enamored by um, the conceptual and the, the sort of the representation as well that's very iconic um uh, i think that that's also an attractor uh, but i also come from uh, a technical background so i appreciated the sort of uh thinking outside of the box or the, the way um I, I, in a way i feel like my education was a bit superficial so i feel like my experience at gsep has uh, made me evolve intellectually a lot um 
Uh, so I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. So uh, Jose, since you uh, studied in in uh, in, Illinois, in the Illinois Institute, so you have experience in the in the U.S., but you're also coming from Brazil. Uh, how was your experience in the studio culture between the uh, undergraduate or the graduate school and also between Latin America and the U.S.? Perhaps the relationship and communication with the critics or peers was different uh, in their undergrad versus uh, GSOP or you felt more comfortable in one uh, school rather than the other? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think just going to to IIT, it was also like a very technical school. So I, I my feeling was that there was a lack of like urbanism approach to the whole thing. Uh, it was very focused on architecture, and it was great for me to understand what I I, I think I liked and I didn't I did not like. Um, so after I finished, although like, I think it was great, uh, it, it was a great architecture school and very technical and everything, but I, I felt I was missing this, um, kind of this other approach to this more, you know, larger scale and the issues of like, um, city and, you know, resiliency and all that. So that had a lot to do with the, uh, my choice to go to GSEP and you know, the urban design program, it's led by a landscape architect, uh, which is very interesting. Um, it's not very usual. Um, and, but I, I guess that's, that's really important to the approach of the school to being, being more, tackling more of those climate issues, you know, and uh, as I mentioned, like issues of, of, of wetness and water scarcity. Um, and I think it's like one of the biggest themes today. So it's a very innovative school in that sense. Um, and I think we had, uh, our professors were very diverse, which was very good as well. So I, I feel very grateful, uh, that GSEP, um, kind of leads the way, uh, on like tackling those issues. Thank you. So we we got a question from Yanis that I think is perfect to start talking a little bit about the experience during GSAP. So Yanis is asking, can you talk about some exceptional faculty members that inspired or challenged you and helped you expand your horizons? And any of you are welcome to answer this question. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think there are several uh, faculty that I, I kind of uh, got really inspired. One is um, Michael Murphy. He leads the, he's the founder of like mass design architecture. And uh, I think he graduated from Harvard and the, the office is in Boston, but also in, in I think in, in Africa, he has one office there as well. So he his whole architecture office uh, designed to you know um, deal with with these issues of like developing countries. So it, it was one that really inspired me. Um, and I, I guess uh, J, J um, is James no Justin Moore. Um, was one of uh, our urban design professors and he had this approach of being more uh, ad advocative for like this um, community issues uh, had like a lot of direct relations to to the community um, you know to inequality so I guess we're two of my professors who really inspired me Um, in my case, as for the AAD program, um, I had studio with Nerea Calvillo, and it was absolutely amazing. I guess it was also uh, the fact that it was my first semester there, 
and she had this discourse constantly on just unlearn what you know already and be open to learning in a different way. And I feel that was a great introduction to what GSAP came to be throughout the whole year of the program. Um, super stimulating and super, yeah, amazing. And also Mark Wasiuta, which I feel follows kind of like the same line. Um, he's a co-director of the CCC program, so I think he feeds a lot of the topics that he teaches in the CCC program to the AAD program, and I think that that mix is incredible and super enriching, and I would really encourage whoever has the opportunity to take a class with him to do so. Yeah, I think we're all in agreement that GSAP has very inspiring uh, professor, like when, when I was a student, just to give an example, Carla Brotstein investigating about uh, death and, and how there are different options for body disposition. And even though it's a very hard topic to, to talk about, I think it's, it's very important now with, that we face a, a global pandemic and it, it just, uh, it's just inspiring to, to explore different uh, options. Uh, so Juan Sebastián is raising his hand. Let's let him ask his question. <laughs> thank you, Ines. Uh, and thank you to all the panelists who not only were generous with their time, but also with their experiences. Um, I found a common thread in your presentations uh, since pretty much all of you during your time at GSAP uh, kept bringing cases from Latin American cities and try to bring that kind of perspective into uh, at least for uh, the UP program, which I'm a, a student in, uh, seems to be very New York centered at times. Uh, so I would like to ask you how this work on Latin American cities was received during your time at GSAP. What, what was kind of the feedback that you got? Uh, how did you feel encouraged to keep uh, pursuing these types of research? Or do you think there was more that than GSAP as an institution or certain professors could do to um, perhaps uh, bro broaden the, um, the scope of, of how we are looking at cities outside the US? can jump in that one since I'm the MUP <laughs> representative. I think uh, at least for me, um, I didn't feel that GSAP will not encourage you to work in any city or any region, actually the opposite. So not even Latin America, but like anywhere. So I think um, people take it in, do, in two different approaches. So I had a lot of friends from Latin America working on their thesis and projects in actu their actual cities or places where they have previous knowledge. I think that's a great approach if you want to kind of advance some specific research. Well, my personal approach was the opposite, was, okay, I'm just going to use this opportunity to maybe be exposed to things that I have not, or I will not have a chance again. <clears throat> so I actually took a class that's called African Cities, which was great. Was, uh, with, so a little bit of the other question as well, <clears throat> for Matipa, and she was really trying to <clears throat> make us unlearn as well, how we see cities and how we see, so from black bodies to actually understanding when we define cities and why. And it was a very intense class. And after that, I think I was also doing my thesis in, in topics related to oil industry, for instance, and LNG, natural gas industry. So finally I jumped in and I did my thesis in Angola. So everyone was asking you, why? You are from Latin America and you're doing something in Angola? I'm like, what the hell, you know? But I think GSAP allows you to explore at the level that you kind of put yourself into. So definitely it requires maybe more effort or even getting professors from SIPA or from other, you know, departments to kind of uh, guide your research or your, um, I don't know, whatever project you have. But yeah, at, at that point, I think at least in MUP, we didn't have that many professors working in Latin America. We did travel to the Dominican Republic though. So we had a sort of a studio class there and that was great. 
And for that one, at least like half of the group spoke Spanish and half of it spoke English. So I don't know, I was really impressed to have like, I don't know, to so translating and trying to really make it work for everyone. So yeah, I think it might really depend on, on the specificity of your topic, city, and also what professors are available at that moment. In my experience, I don't think it was a problem, but yeah, it, you, could, you could find depending on what's your topic and the city. So I don't know if that answers the question. Perhaps uh, some of the other um, degrees are more diverse. I felt like there were, there were, there was one semester where there were two traveling studios to Brazil, uh, which was uh, great. Uh, so I definitely feel like there were some studios that were uh, Latin oriented that um, where the majority of the students were weren't necessarily international students. So that I thought that was a great um, trend as well with the fact that more yeah. um, American students are interested in, in Latin American countries. Yeah, no, that's right. That's right. It's a lot of studios that time, one in, in Colombia as well. And then they have also a studio in Chile twice. So yeah, there's always something happening, like a couple of them in Puerto Rico as well. So, that's true. So moving uh, a little bit to experience, also like when, when you were in GSAP, when I was in, in, in GSAP in 2016, 2017, the conversations in Avery Hall were around the elections and Trump being the president of the US. Uh, nowadays, we're actively discussing COVID and Black Lives Matter. I'm curious to know what was the main event or focus in the years that you were students. At least for us, we have Maria heating, so it was like hurricanes and floating and really trying to understand that and yeah. Yeah, and I guess, yeah, I mean, we, we're still talking about uh, yeah. <laughs> elections and yeah, um, okay. Uh, also, like speaking from my experience when I was a student, uh, I was excited about the diversity of topics that the professor would address in their studios, but also about the different generations. So, for example, in an um, older generation, there is Richard Plons or Bernard Schumi. Later, there is uh, Mabel Wilson or Mark Surumaki. And in a more younger generation, there is Adam Frampton, Leon Leon, Christoph Kompoch. So there have been many changes in the past uh, four years. I'm curious to know what was your perception if, and if you were able to, to, to read these different uh, generations and how uh, the the, the different uh, professors influenced your uh, experience in GSAP? Um, I can go first. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you're welcome. Um, uh, I, I totally see the difference with, with um, that comes with with the academic year where these professors were formed, let's say, and they can really, um, I guess I can see the generational difference, but more so I think I felt a difference in the way that they were addressing the topics, let's say. I feel that there was a group of professors who would try to stay away from the architecture for the human as much as possible, which would be kind of, like the tendency that maybe Andres Hake is following right now. Uh, but then you have like this other super social approach where the mini scale and the detail is, it's the focus. So I, I think that more than generational difference, I would say that I did perceive a radical difference that could be pocketed in how, how professors approach architecture and, and they're all radically different. And I think it's incredible to have that diversity in in one room yeah yeah i agree uh so jose based on your interest in addressing your hometown's environmental challenges how do you feel gsap shaped the way you practice today or you understand and or, or read uh fortaleza um 
I mean, definitely Giuseppe in my time there, um, especially like I mentioned, just doing projects in, uh, let's say, similar um, conditions in a way. Um, definitely, I mean, it helped me to be more, let's say, in contact with the issues back home. Uh, to be honest, I I wish I will I, I was more, and I I'm looking like. I'm planning to be more involved, uh, definitely in the near future and the future to issues in Brazil. Uh, but I guess just the whole process of like just learning the process of urban design and and you know the research and the stakeholders and and everything it just helps to read much better uh, those you know those urban systems the the you know the relationships that kind of govern um how we look um to cities so um it definitely definitely helps me read much better but i i intend to actually have a, a closer relationship to you know projects back home and and you know trying to have some impact in the future in brazil so the next question is coming from Pauline herself. <laughs> so do you, I, I think it's very important what, what you're mentioning. So go, go ahead and, and tell us all the question. <laughs> no, no, I was just like wondering since Alice kind of introduced part of the panel in the beginning. And so what's the opinion of the group of like uh, related to BSA and black like faculty GSAP uh, letters? So I, I think that that's something that I will just kind of like to put out there because to me, I felt uh, actually very proud that GSAP and the black faculty members really came out with this letter. I, I think it's super to the point and it challenges the institution, not only GSAP, but kind of brings up the topic to many other institutions. I can see that in our office as well. So ACOM is also going through a lot of conversations, discussions, you know, so we're starting to talk about the topics about racial discrimination and all that. And I'm sure as, um, other people were mentioning in their talks, we have the similar issues in Latin America. So I feel that we are not in the same process, but at least we have similar questions that we need to kind of attend. And some of them are related to privilege. And I remember in Latin GSAP, we started talking about these issues a little bit, like what, what's this group for, you know, it was more like a professional or it's more like to a safety network for the people that are coming or what was, and I think, those questions are always kind of like in the back of our heads, at least for me. And so I don't know, just wanted to like put it out there for others to comment on. Yeah. So. It's yeah, a hard yeah. one. <laughs> and the, the other yeah. thing uh, I was discussing with uh, Juan Sebastian that I, I feel that even though there is um, racism issues in, in Latin America or in, in Colombia, it, it is not, I, in my opinion, it, it, it doesn't feel as strong as it is in the US. Um, and I'm wondering if it's because it's, it's sometimes hidden by our uh, social economical issues that are uh, probably stronger. Yeah, I, you know, yeah, I was thinking about that a little bit as well, um, specifically in Brazil. Um, I, I use, you know, like we have, I think we also have, if you think about the education in Latin America, maybe some, some countries have the same kind of Eurocentric education. And in Brazil, like we, we kind of, uh, we tend to celebrate the mix of races. We, we say like it's, it's, and, and we should celebrate the mix of races in Brazil, but at the same time, um, there are a lot of people just think that these issues are not so present there just because of the mix and everything. But I think they are as strong as here. We just don't talk much back home, I guess, because we tend to say, oh, it's fine, we celebrate and everything, and but uh, the real issues, I think people don't 
don't really talk. I, I don't think Brazil is as peaceful as the citizens think the, the country is in relation to to race and everything. So, and I think the, the statement is, that is very interesting because instead of like um, first proposing, you know, the school to address something, like it, it, it kind of demands the school to look into the their own structure and how that contributes to, to white supremacy. So I think that was like very clever, just like first thinking of like yourself and and your maybe your education that you, you had back home and and then you start thinking in a different way of like how things uh work there so i at least that's how i took it like i it prompted me to like think how my education was there and then how you know just uh thinking about the the whole structure um how that you know plays out i think uh, i don't know the, the, this notion of like looking to yourself first and, and seeing how maybe you know these things are structured yeah i i wanted to add up and that i feel related to that as well so when all the movement the protest was happening in the united states and seeing how it resonate in so many other countries and that uh, i see back at home here in sao paulo that there was no, like it was really little sound and movement about it. So I just kept me thinking about like, wow, like those other countries, they're at least voicing and they hear the, con the conversation didn't even start. So it just, in my opinion, it felt very alarming. And then even like living right next to a monument that uh, has like two horses with, uh, and, like indigenous people pulling the boat. So like, what does that mean? And that I live my like 25 years right next to the monument and never ever like question it. So I think that was a lot of rethinking and contemplating like all the education that I have during like high school, how the history was taught. I think it made me really reflect like all, uh, well, all that is happening at least like from my background until now. There, there is a question from Yanis. I don't know if um, I'll, I'll just read it. Uh, do you guys think there is a meritocracy or not? Do you think the faculty, for example, or the admitted students got their position or their admission because of the color of their skin? And are there faculty or students from your experience that were there without deserving it? Oh, that's, that's a tough one. Mm. Um. I can talk to that, but maybe I won't respond to the question because I just wanted to say that I believe that we kind of need to always be analyzing who is at the program, where does it come from, and trying to like see our backgrounds just to understand who we are. And I think that was something that we were starting to do, letting this in some of the conversations that I was able to be in. And it's interesting because um, I think just because the background that you have and the opportunities that you had had to, to be able to access to apply to Columbia University, you know, you're far away probably from many other people that have been left out. So it's, I don't, I don't know, I, I, I kind of don't want to relate to the question directly, but I think uh, it's interesting to see the letter and see what are the needs for opening these spaces so we can have like more diversity in the program and, and same for each country, I believe. So, yeah, I don't know. I I mean, wanted, it's a hard one. Hmm? Sure. I just wanted to share the information that the students also participate in the uh, admittance process. Um, so just food for thought um, for you to think about your question. And also a little bit of insight into some of the work that we're doing internally. Um, uh, you know, relating specifically to um, a coalition that's being uh, generated right now to potentially uh, recommend faculty hiring. Uh, this is not something that happens at GSEP at the moment, but there's definitely interest, um, I can say, on the part of um, quite a few PhD students, quite a few MRC students, uh, and UP students. We would love for that process to be even more pluralistic. So if you can participate in any way, uh, please feel free to reach out.
Yeah, and perhaps based on what you guys are saying, I'm thinking also about uh, scholarships. I mean, scholarship is just uh, the great opportunity to allow uh, my minorities in, in Latin America or even in, in, in this country to to get access to such schools. And, and, and that I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that hasn't been mentioned, like the the access to scholarships and how that can help to diversify the, the school. Unfortunately, most of the scholarships offered by Colombia are for Americans. Um, so that's definitely a challenging um, situation for us as international students uh, dealing with the cost. Uh, we Often we have to look for scholarship programs in our country, um, very difficult to Solution coming from Colombia. Yeah, and most of the scholarship from our countries require us to go back. So after we finish the whatever program we enroll in, at least like from here, then most of them you have to come back, which like it helps with that, but then it stops your progress, you know. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I mean, through your presentations and the discussion, I've heard a lot about the studios, uh, studios or trips that are done um, in or to Latin America. Uh, I'm wondering if you guys think we are well represented because it, it, it seems like we are, but then the, there are still we're still a, a minority, and and I, I would like to just to know your opinion on that. I guess it changes from program to program and a lot in which year you're taking your master's in. But in my case, I, I could say that it, maybe I was, I was in a particular year, but in my class there was a, a big concentration of Latin American people and it was, it was great, both in as students and as professors, maybe it was the program again in my year, but I, I did feel that there was a lot of, of inclusion of, of people from all over the world. I, I, I honest never felt that, that Latin American people were a minority in my class. Yeah, I think uh, in the urban design program, I, I think I could relate to that. I mean, uh, there is there is diversity. I think only, I don't know, from 53, only what five or six students were Americans. The rest was uh, a lot. I have to say a lot of students from, from Asia as well. Um, but I, I felt we had a we had a good mix and Maybe it's because, I mean, I don't know. I think um, the urban design program is very, it looks, it's a forward thinking a lot. So I, I definitely, I didn't feel that there was a lack of diversity in my year at least. Yeah. I in Inia is saying, I think it's also important to differentiate that racial diversity is not the same as economic diversity and that they can be intersectional uh, regarding our discussion. I uh, totally agree with that. But for example, in my particular case, I got an admission scholarship as a Mexican student to, to GSAP. So I think there is an intersection there. Yeah. Yeah. And well, maybe a last uh, question before we wrap up. Like we, we are all, the, the, the five of us are here in, in, in New York and, and still trying to absorb as much as possible from the city, but do you feel motivated to bring at some point your knowledge that, the knowledge that you gain in GSAP or in New York to your countries? Definitely, but in my personal case is what I'm really looking for. That that's, I guess, my professional and personal goal to go back to Mexico and fit it back to whatever I learned.
Yeah, I mean, I, same I, same for me. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, just try and follow it up on that. It's the same for me. I don't know if like physically or like just kind of like trying to work from here and there and maybe. So I, I really believe that we can do a lot of things collaboratively with groups. So if you have the right um, contacts in place and I think that's something that I learned at GSAP. I think a lot of things were happening in multiple regions at the same time. And yeah, I'm looking forward to be able to work in Chile, but also in, in other regions in Latin America as well. So I think um, there's definitely a lot to do. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. Maybe for me, it's not so clear. Um, my heart definitely wants to go back and wants to make a difference with all of the knowledge that I've gained. But at the same time, um, all of the years that I've invested um, in this, um, I guess, I feel like I it's two different worlds of the architect in Brazil, Brazilian architect and, and architect in the United States. Uh, so it feels like a, it's not so easy to go back to your country and resume uh, in the profession the same. I feel like you need to relearn everything in a way when you go back after having been in the United States for so many years. So for me, maybe it's not uh, such a clear um, uh, path, but definitely, definitely think we should do something with all of the knowledge that we've gained being outside. You say you were gonna say something that interrupted. No, I, was, I was gonna. I was gonna say that I. I have the same. Um, same idea of like uh, going back. I, I I don't have a lot of experience working there. I only worked a year there and I finished uh, my undergrad here, uh, did my master's here. So I think this there is this um, kind of idea. I, I have this kind of idea of like, you know, going back and, and really, you know, live more uh, the reality there. Um, so I think I have, I, I would relate to what has been said. Yeah. Okay. Well, to all of you, thank you so much. It was lovely to have you in our first fall conversation series. And thank you for the people who join us here in Zoom. And thank you also for supporting uh, Latin GSAP. So we hope to see you in the next event. And yeah. This is it for tonight. I will ask the panelists just to say a few, few minutes uh, for some last uh, comments, but thank you all for coming.